So this morning, uh, we are back in John 8. We're going to be starting in verse 12. If you want to look along in your own Bible, uh, we have Bibles in the seat backs in front of you, uh, or you can watch on the screen as well. Uh, and we're covering chapters 5 through 12 in this series on the book of John, which covers primarily the opposition that Jesus faced. And this is important because it teaches us what it means to really recognize Jesus' authority. It teaches us the true cost of following Jesus. It teaches us how we can avoid spiritual blindness and what it looks like to walk in the light. That it may prepare believers to face spiritual opposition with perseverance and with faith. Amen, church? Now, as we prepare to read this passage, we, we find Jesus, like he was in chapter 7, still at the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, this was a, a, a week-long festival where they celebrated God's provision. When they were wandering in the desert, you can reach about, read about that in Exodus, when all the Israelites were wandering, and they would come together to worship him. Now in the final day of this week-long festival, they are gathered in the temple courts. You can see an artist drawing up there. And they're all standing near the, the four 75-foot golden candlesticks that were lit in remembrance of when God provided light in the desert to the Israelites in the form of a pillar of fire. It said that these candlesticks were so bright they lit up the entire courtyard. So I want you to imagine yourself being there this morning as Jesus stands up and he begins to speak, starting in verse 12. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, the religious leaders of that time, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Once again, and I say this because you all, if you've been here any time, you know the most hated out of context verse I have, Matthew 7, 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. So I got to stop on this for just a second and throw on my, get on my soapbox. Jesus is not reinforcing the idea that nobody should ever judge anyone and we should all hold hands and sing kumbaya and everybody's perfect. Okay. He goes on later in verse 26 to talk about his judging. And in verse, in last chapter, in verse 24, he says, you, if you judge, you need to judge rightly. And these Pharisees, they were judging in the flesh. They were judging according to what they see. So once again, he's reminding them they're judging by the wrong standards. Okay, off my soapbox. Back to verse 16. He says, yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it's not alone, I alone who judges, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And obviously, when he mentions the Father, he's referencing God the Father. Verse 19. Therefore, they said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Because where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, 
then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. All right, let me stop for a water break. That was a lot of verses. So in uh, chapter 8, Jesus said to him, Jesus makes the second of what are called the seven I am statements about himself. In the Old Testament, when God was revealing his name to Moses, how did he reveal it? He says, I am who I am. So thus in Judaism, I am is understood as a name for God. Whenever Jesus makes an I am statement, when he, where he is claiming attributes of a deity, he's identifying himself as God. So in John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of, anybody? Bread of life, very good. And in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. What does it mean that Jesus is the light of the world? Let's start there. It means that Jesus is our knowledge and our truth. He's our guide in this life. He is our hope from sin. He is our eternal life. He is victory over evil. And he's our revelation of God. The 18th century minister, John Wesley, he says, when I have Christ, I have light enough. I want no more. His light is my guide, my comfort, my strength, and my salvation. Second question, why does the world need light? Why does the world need light? You don't need a light in the middle of the day. There's a need for light. What is that need? Christianity teaches that the world is in darkness. Not a physical darkness, but a spiritual darkness. You see evidence of this darkness. Just to name a few, water, war, murder, Sexual assaults, hate crimes, mass shootings, political plural, polarization, broken families and marriages, suicide, depression, poverty, and hunger. We could spend all morning talking about all the ways that our world is in darkness. Now, the problem with our society and why Jesus' message is so important, in my, in my opinion, is we spend a lot of times trying to solve the problems of our world instead of learning what is the root cause of the problems. I mean, listen, watch politics, because you can't get away from it right now, Lord help us. They're always talking, here's what we're going to do, solve the problem. This, 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 and this. But I don't ever hear them talking about the root of the problem. Let's take, for example, gun violence. And listen, before I say what I'm going to say, this is not political, what I'm saying. So all you hyper-political people, no offense, but like, don't amen me because you think I'm like supporting your, like, your thoughts here. Not doing that. I'm not being political. Just telling you what I notice. I hear so much talk about gun, restricting gun access. Once again, not giving opinion on restricting gun access one way or another. Don't get caught up in that. But what I wish in all of this talk no matter who's right or who's wrong, which way we go, I wish we would talk more about what causes a man to pull the trigger on another man. I feel like in our country, we talk about how to protect ourselves or prevent the bad things, but we don't want to look at the heart of the issues. I feel like society, it's like a, a, a guy stumbling around in the, in the pitch dark. You know what that's like? You ever got up in the middle of the night so dark, your eyes haven't adjusted, you can't see, right? You're stumbling around. You know, if you have one of those sharp edges to your bed frame and the mattress doesn't stick out all the way, cuts your leg off, right? You hit your head, you bang your knees. God forbid your kids let their Legos out on the floor, right? Like, and you're, it's dark, so you don't even know what you're hitting at first, but you just keep hitting and knocking yourself, and you're, you're banged up, and you're, you're bleeding, and you're just beat down, and you, you don't even know what hits you. 
I feel like that's what our society is. Even in our own relationships and lives, we end up with broken relationships, broken marriages, broken work relationships. We're hopping from one church to another, and, and you know, when things go wrong and we just feel beat up and we don't like we don't even know what hit us, we don't even know what happened. Now I suspect we don't want to talk about the heart of the issue, the heart of the darkness in our society, because we all, because people like deep down they know where it leads. It leads to sin. I sense my opinion, that's why you don't see people wanting to talk about it, because it's always going to lead there. Now, if you ever read Romans 5, the Apostle Paul, he had no problem talking about the heart of the issue. I'm going to outline it for you. Paul basically says this. He goes, listen, sin entered the world through one man, through Adam. And then death entered the world through sin. And then sin and death spread. And finally, sin and death reigned in this world. And that's the heart of the issue. That is why the world is ultimately in darkness. It is the only answer that can explain if you are willing to think and go deep enough of why the world the way is the way that it is. It is the only answer to why the world is as bad as it is. I mean, think about it. Why after thousands of years, if we're evolving... Why we have we never learned from previous generations? Why we have we not solved all the world's problems of famine and hunger and murder and war? Like if we have learned over time the devastating effects of human slavery, how come we have thousands upon thousands of people being trafficked in our country alone every year? Now, and once again, the easy reaction is to turn and blame other people, and especially in an election year. But the source of all of it, Christianity says, it is sin. It is sin that has entered the world like a cancer and brought darkness with it. Now, we, like I said, if you sit here today and you're like, I don't know who God is, you've got to think deeper. We spend so much life, we don't even think about why things are so bad. We don't go to those deeper levels. And then, so the world is in darkness, and we're just blind to the source of it all. We're so numb and used to it. Proverbs 4.19 says, The way of the wicked is like, is like a deep, deep darkness. They do not know what they stumble over. Now, Christianity also says the cure for this darkness is Jesus. John 1, 4 through 5, it says, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. For the darkness of, of, of falsehood and lies, Jesus is the light of the truth. To the, to the darkness of ignorance, he's, he's the light of wisdom. The darkness of sin, he's, like, he's the light of holiness. The darkness of sorrow and sadness, he is the light of joy. And the darkness of death, he is the light of life. He is the freedom from the darkness. Listen to what it says, Scripture says, about people who follow Christ. And, and I highlight the word follow here, which we'll talk more about next week, because of what he says in verse 12. In John 8, 12, he says, Whoever follows me, whoever follows me will walk in darkness. Uh, who will not, <laughs> whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Let me make sure I fix that one. But will have the light of life. Paul says in Colossians that he has delivered us, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Ephesians 5.8, for at one time you were, you were, darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Scripture says this is what is available to all who follow Christ. Amen. 
Now, this is where it's easy for some people to be like, sure, I believe in Jesus. I follow him. He's a good example. He taught good things. But following Jesus is something different than some might expect. You see, to follow Jesus as Jesus means it, it starts with you seeing Jesus a particular way. You have to see him in a certain light. In John 8, 28, in John 8 verse 28, Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Jesus says, when you see me lifted up. To follow Jesus, to be freed from darkness, you have to see Jesus lifted up. In other words, you have to see him crucified on the cross. You have to see him on the cross dying for your sins, for your darkness. You, don't just, you can't just see him as a prophet. That's not a Christian. You can't see him just as a teacher. That's not a Christian. You can't see him just as a miracle worker. Not a Christian. You have to see him as your Savior and your Lord. You see, these religious people, they didn't like Jesus, one, because he challenged their view of themselves. They thought they were good enough for God. They looked at other people who did not as do as many religious things as they did, and they're like, we're better off. They didn't think they needed anything but all the rules and laws that they were following. And this is why when Jesus said, I'm going to a place that you cannot go, they literally thought, well, is he going to kill himself? Because in their culture, they believed that anyone who killed themselves would go directly to hell. So if they knew they were going to heaven, then literally the only plausible explanation is, oh, he must be on his way to hell. I, I, people still today don't see their need for Jesus. They still think they're good enough. Or they, they don't think they're good enough, but they're working on being good enough. And yet the Bible is so, if you read it, it's so opposite to that line of thinking. Paul in Romans 3, verse 10, he says this. He says, none is righteous. Nobody. Okay? Nobody. Your sweet grandma, Billy Graham, right? Pastor Jeff. Ain't nobody righteous. Nobody. Nobody understands. Nobody seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. He says nobody does good. Not even one. The prophet Isaiah says that our works, all our good deeds, they are like filthy rags to God. And we know this from Scripture. Even our ability to do good deeds comes from God. On our own, left to ourselves, there's no one who is good in the eyes of God. No one. None. So in other words, to follow Jesus, to see Jesus as the light, you have to see him as the answer to the darkness in your life. He has to be the answer. That's why Jesus cannot just be a prophet. He can't be a miracle worker. He can't be a teacher. And, and this is a very humbling step to admit you are not as good as you think you are. Now, some of us were like, well, that's, that works out great. I don't think I'm good at all. <laughs> but you do. You do. It comes in the moments when you compare yourself to other people who are even worse than you. We all do it. Because there's a need inside of us. God placed need for us to justify our worth and identity. Have you ever wondered why you care? Like, why do I need to feel worthy? Why do I need to feel good about my, Like, why does that even cross your mind? Why do I need to feel valuable? Why? I mean, why? Somebody placed it there. It's a humbling step. I am not as good as I think I am. I am not as good or better than the other people I see around me. 
there is nothing good in me that originates in myself but selfishness and pride. That's it. You have to come to that place to be able to see Jesus lifted up. If you think there is goodness that originates in you, if you think you're not a selfish and prideful being full of sin, you can't see Jesus on the cross. You, you can't because you don't see a need for him. Do you see Jesus lifted up this morning? Do you see him as the answer for the darkness and sin in your life? And, and, and this is hard for us because it, it goes against the, the messages of, our, of our, our recent culture that tells us we're just great the way we are. You get woke psychology out there of our day that says, you know, you just can't have negative talk in your life. You know, everybody loves you just the way that you are. You're great. And if they don't like you, there's something wrong with them. And actually, I agree that we shouldn't verbally or emotionally beat ourselves up, which we're all prone to do when we look long in the mirror. But I would also say that the only way you won't emotionally beat yourself up, verbally beat yourself up over and over again, is by looking at Jesus lifted on the cross. That's the only way you can accomplish that. See, people who hate themselves, who can't stand themselves, which is different than knowing there's nothing good in you, they don't see Jesus lifted up on the cross. If you see Jesus lifted up on the cross, you don't hate yourself. Anybody who sees Jesus lifted up on the cross, they're they're attracted to him. They want to draw close to him. People who hate themselves, who are constantly beating themselves up all the time, who live in constant condemnation. They're the people saying, I'm just too bad for God. I'm too bad for others. I'm worse than others around me. I don't deserve anything good. Or some of us, like we know Christ in our mind, we grew up in church, but he's never entered our heart. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. But we do not make the connection of what that does for our lives. It's this random outside fact instead of a truth that touches our hearts. People who see Jesus up on the cross, say, man, man, there is nothing good in me. I am selfish. I am prideful. I want to be my own God, and yet Jesus came down and he died for me. I was always going to be selfish. I was always going to be sinful. I was always going to live for myself. I didn't even ask him to come, and he came and he did what I could not do. I didn't have the ability to do it. I could never do it. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I use this illustration all the time. When somebody, if you're drowning out in the ocean, right? right? We saw from the, the, the hurricane, there was a guy floating on, through the hurricane on a cooler for 19 hours. Do you think when the Coast Guard pulled up to that dude, he was angry at himself for not getting himself back to shore? No, I bet you that man was in tears. So thankful that he was saved because he understood he had no hope outside of somebody else saving him. So there was probably joy, hugs, tears. A Christian is the same way. They understand that Jesus threw a lifeline. We had no other option, and so they're just so grateful. So thankful that they were saved. I'm praying today That for anyone in here that needs to, you'll finally see Jesus lifted up on the cross. You'll finally see him on the cross for your sins. And you put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior. You'll say, Jesus, you died for me. My sins separated me from you. I can't save myself, but you can. I'm putting my faith and my hope in you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you the rest of my days. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Are you with me, church? Some of you, that is all that's waiting to happen. 
and you want your life to change, it's going to change when you see Jesus lifted up on that cross. Now I said, this is opposite to the thinking of the world. It talks about higher self-esteem, which is really just, we'll get this another time, but I don't believe in self-esteem. I believe that's a lie from the, the pit, of, pit of hell. Okay? Right? Our esteem comes from God and God alone. It's another sermon. You're lucky I'm not going into it now. I'm trying to keep it under two hours today. Just kidding. Um, you see, for a Christian, and this is how the light of Christ continues to shine in your life even after you see him lifted up, because the light just doesn't stop. There's this unique thing, this unique self-image that we have as Christians where that whereas before you found Christ you think worse of yourself and then you'd feel low, worse about yourself when you find Christ you think worse about yourself but it actually leads you to thinking better about everything and it brings you more joy and peace like when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior your sin is exposed. But then when you start to follow him, the depth of your sin is exposed because it's always deeper than you realize. Like take, for example, you have a, a businessman. I've seen men kind of like this, and, and, and they're in business, and they believe in making more money and more control and more power, and so they'll cut corners, they'll cheat on taxes, they'll drive up prices, they'll push people around, whatever they got to do to move themselves up. And then they find Jesus. And they look back on the way that they're living their lives. And they reflect and they repent. And then they, maybe they get into a church. And, and they've changed the way that they're doing business now. But there's still that sin there. And so in their marriages, in their church relationships, uh, with their children, with their neighbors, they, like they, they always have to kind of still be in control. They have to have the upper hand. So some brothers in Christ will come to them and say, look, you know, you're always kind of controlling in your relationships. You know, you're, you're always having to, to get your way in relationships. And the man's like, wow, you're right. And then he repents and he grows. And then they put him on a, like a, an elder board, elder, a leader in the church. And then as he's in elder meetings, he gets angry every time he doesn't get his way. Right, it has to be in the decision that, that, that's made. And so a couple of elders come to him and they're like, you know, kind of grumpy when you don't get your way. It's like it always has to go your direction. And he's like, wow, you're right. And then he repents and he praises the Lord. And whatever areas of your life, and you all got them, you all got them. Whatever sins you struggle with, the more you follow the Lord, the more that sin will, and the depth of that sin will be exposed, which is really not fun. I mean, it, it, and, and you could be tempted to think if you're sitting here and you're not a Christian, you're like, man, what a rotten existence. I'm going to spend all my days feeling horrible about myself. But that is the funny thing about the gospel. As you grow in maturity, you start to understand how it works. Paul Washer said this once. He said like, he said, the closer I get to God, the more I see my sin and the ugliness that's inside me, and so the more I despair. But he says, the more I despair, the more I look to my Savior on the cross. And I think of his mercy and his grace and his salvation, and it brings me joy. And so then I draw closer to God, and then I find more sin. And he goes it over and over and over again. You see, a mature believer, someone who's growing in Christ, they start to appreciate, they start to be thankful when sin is exposed in their lives, which is not easy to do. The godliest people I've met in my life, they're people who don't think that they're any better than anyone else, any criminal I remember I had this one pastor. He says, look, I'm no better than Hitler. I'm like, well, you know, statistically. And he said, no. He goes, listen, 
if I was given the same circumstances, the same decisions I made as he made, the same influences as he made, the same sin is in me that was in him. I'm capable of doing what he did. See, the godliest people I know understand that they're no better than anyone else, that they're capable of the same sin of everyone else. And it frees them from pride. And it brings them humility to grow. Not in big things like wars, but even in marriages and in families and in the churches. And they're okay not being better than anyone else because they remember what they read in Romans. They remember what they read. And I'm not good enough on my own anyway. And yet God saved me. And now God's showing me my sin and all the things that destroy relationships and destroy what I love and destroy me. And he's freeing me from those as I look to him, praise God. And so I'm praying for those of you today, and, and this is myself, and I'm a little hesitant to say this to my wife because I feel like she'll hold me accountable to this next time. But um, is, is what I'm hoping is that as a Christian, you will develop a new level of thankfulness for God's light in your life. That when somebody, whether it's God's word and through the power of the Holy Spirit or a trusted person in your life, points out sin in your life, that your response will be, thank you, God, for showing me my sin. Thank you, God, for showing me my sin. Right? Now, our temptation is to feel bad and to feel condemned. Well, actually, our temptation is to tell them they're wrong and they're the ones who are sinful. That's our real temptation. But let's say we get past that step, right? Our temptation is to feel bad and to feel condemned. The only way you can feel bad and condemned is if you're not seeing Jesus on the cross. Okay? It's the only way. Because when you don't see Jesus on the cross, I mean, when you see Jesus on the cross, it's because you realize that there's nothing good in you. So you're not surprised when you find sin in your life. It's always the, only those who still think that they're able to produce enough of their own goodness that are not surprised or crushed when they find sin in their lives. And so as a brother and sister in Christ, if you sit here today, and, 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 and even for myself, which would be very hard to do, easy to preach, hard to do, I just want to say, God, thank you for showing me my sin. Thank you for not leaving me in the things that are going to destroy the people I love and my relationship with you. And then you go repent. And you start again growing and walking in that new knowledge of your sin. Do you hear me, church? So this week, Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing me it was wrong to say those things to the person who cut me off. Mm -hmm. Come on. Thank you for showing me it was wrong that I was selfish with my spouse. Thank you for showing me it was wrong to ignore this problem. Thank you for showing me it was wrong to... to Cheat on my text. Whatever it may be, thank you for convicting me of looking at things on the internet that I should not look at. Thank you for convicting me of not serving in my church. Wherever it may be, say, I want you to start with that. Thank you for showing me. Thank you for, it will radically change your life and how you deal with your sin if you God, it's God, thank you for lighting up the darkness in my life. Are you with me, church? I am kid you not. This is a very basic thing, but it will change your life if you can grasp it. And then finally, the third thing I want you to take home today, and I've told you this before, the way that you have joy, the way that you have courage, the way that you have hope in this world is if that things that you bring you joy, that bring you hope, that bring you courage are bigger than the problems and the darkness of this world. And that's where Jesus is light in a third way. He points us to heaven. That one day he will come again. Or we'll breathe our last breath, whichever happens first. And for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they'll be in his presence for all of eternity. And all of the problems that just cloud our days, that weigh us down, all the things that we just get anxiety from and worry, they'll all be gone. And so I pray this week, as you see him on the cross, as he's making you holier, lighting up sin in your life, it'll all be seen in the context of eternity. Christ is working on you. 
perfecting you as we read in Scripture. He's working all things out in his timing. I mean, look at what we read at the beginning of this. What did we read? This is really important right here. Verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one had rested him because his hour had not yet come. That means God had an appointed time for everything to take place. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to fret, whether it's outside darkness coming into our lives or it's our sin. None of those things because we know that God is in control. He's working things out in his time. We just need to keep our eyes on Christ. And that will give us the courage, the joy, the peace, and the hope to be obedient to him and to his word. It's just a matter if we'll choose to look at him or not. Amen, church? Bow your heads with me.